Schwarzenegger was the governor of the Central Bank of uh, Argentina between 2015 and 2018. Uh, also served his country in a very interesting way, like in the friends in the family, I think, uh, as a congressman uh, for the Republic of Argentina, uh, also for the period of 13 to 2015. He also worked in the private sector, so it stands banks very well as president and CEO of Banco Ciudad de Buenos Aires uh, between 2008 and 2013. And also has a very distinguished academic career, not only with vast publication, not only in terms of uh, very interesting articles in global economics, uh, debt management, exchange rates, um, but also uh, an enormous amount of publication in terms of books. Uh, also shares a lot in common with uh, Miami Business School in the fact that he was also the dean uh, and running the MBA and the business program for Universidad Torquato de Tela for many years. And also taught uh, as an assistant professor at UCLA. And finally also a visiting professor of the Kennedy School. Uh, uh well, good, good morning, everybody. And uh, a real pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you, Paulo, for the invitation. Thank you, Manuel, for the invitation whom I've known from, from a long time back, and, uh, and, and it's, really, it's really nice to be here. Um, well, I was a little bit uh, thorn about what to do in this presentation because they gave me a topic, you know, which is the one that you see, what have we learned from debt and exchange rate crisis in Latin America, which I think has to do with my academic research. It has basically focused on debt restructurings and exchange rate regimes. But they also said, talk about whatever you want. So don't worry too much. So I'm, I'm going to follow that rule strictly, and I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about what I want. I'm also going to talk about this, okay? And uh, so I decided to do three things. The first one is to talk about what my obsession is, which is growth and productivity. I'm going to start with that. Then I'm going to go through the the issues that were suggested by by the conference, and then I'm going to end up talking a little bit about these things that we've learned how do they bear on the recent experience in Argentina? So I'm going to kind of go over those three things. So let me start with a productivity growth. I have just one idea that I want you to take from, from my presentation. I've tried to show a couple of graphs uh, to, to underline and try to convince you of this. But the main point is that growth in the world is accelerating over time. So growth is coming each time at a faster and faster pace. In uh, the uh, meeting of the G20 in March, uh, uh, Bill Morneau, which was, is the finance minister of uh, Canada, said growth has never been so fast and never again will it be so slow. Okay? So I want to kind of argue and I want to, 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 to pounce on this idea. And let me start by giving you some data. So the data starts with GDP per capita in year one. One. You know when Jesus was kind of a baby? Huh? And income per capita at that point was, at today's prices, about 800 uh, US dollars. Don't ask me how that is computed. Let's assume it's OK. One of my professors at MIT, Paul Krugman, he used to say that there are two things in the world you don't want to know how they're done, sausages and national accounts, OK? so. Uh, <laughs> So, but, but let's, let, let's take it for good, you know, that uh, $800 per capita was kind of the average income at that time in the Roman Empire. By the year 1800, that number had gone up to 1200. So that means that it took 18 centuries for income per capita in the world to grow by 50%. So it's such a slow pace of growth that people lived in a world where their kids the, the world of your kids was the same as yours. The world of your grandchildren was the same as yours. It was just, I mean, ju growth was just too slow for you to perceive it. By the way, Alejandro said that world is growing at 3.7. Actually, you had three years in a row at 3.7. At 3.7, to have income grow 50%, you needed 11 years, whereas it took the, the world 18 18 centuries to achieve that 50%. So if you would have taken someone in 1800 and you would ask him, tell me how you imagine the year 2000, the most likely answer we would have gotten is that, uh, well, the year 2000 was going to look very much like 1800. And then something happened. No? So let me show you this first graph where 
especially something happens there are around kind of the beginning of the 19th century, end of the 18th century. You see that before that you had income and population basically moving uh, equally, so income per capita were not growing. Population wasn't growing too much either. But then something happens there around 18, seven, between 1700 and 1800, and then you see that the world's production starts growing very fast relative to population. And by the way, population starts growing very much faster as well. So between uh, 1800 and the year 2000, income per capita multiplies basically by 15 times, uh, even though the world population also grows significantly. So the world kind of enters into, into a moment of ex an explosion of growth. And uh, of course, everybody knows what happened around those times, which was the Industrial Revolution. I think the Industrial Revolution was complemented by two other things, which were the French Revolution, because the French Revolution basically freed human capital to find its best opportunity in the world. You know, before you, had to, you were born and it, it was known what you had to do in medieval times, so basically the French Revolution freed us from that constraint and increased the potential of, of, of a, a human capital. And I think the third revolution was the US Constitution because the US Constitution kind of took us away from authoritarianism and kind of provided a framework for, for freedom which is much more conducive to, to economic growth. So, so I think those three combinations basically generated this explosion in wealth. And now I'm going to try to argue that even between these last 200 years, it has been accelerated within the, these 200 years. And uh, a couple of years ago, a professor at Harvard called Michael Kremen, he, he wrote a, a paper called uh, Economic Growth from One Million Before Christ Until Today. And he found there a regularity, I'm, I'm going to say that, I'll repeat it because it, it takes a minute to, basically he finds the regularity that the income per capita in the world is gr growth, the growth of income per capita is proportional to the number of people in the world. So that means that as the world becomes bigger as a market, growth in income per capita accelerates. So as opposed to this view, kind of the world finding somehow a constraint in their potential growth, what Kramer is saying, well, I mean, that may happen, I don't know, in a million years. But so far, we're so far away from our technological frontier that as the markets become bigger, then the, the growth actually is accelerating. Somehow we're finding ways of becoming more and more proactive at, an, at a faster and faster space. And when you think a little bit about it, if you're going to move, say, for example, you remember the film cameras to the digital cameras? It's totally different if you're facing a market of five million people than if you're facing a market of five billion people in terms of your incentives to innovate. So, so I think this has been a little bit, um, this has been a little bit of, uh, of something that I think is very strong and very robust. So I want to show you a, 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 a video, okay? So maybe if, if the team there in the, can help me, I want to kind of show you, I want to show you this uh, improvement in world growth kind of on a, uh, on a real time scale. Can, can we get, get it all the way down to 1800? Okay, you see now it's, it's yeah, okay, good, good play. Well, stop, stop for a second. Uh, take it back. Thank you, this case is good. Take it back to the beginning. So basically what I'm going to show you here is uh, incomes in the world. And we're going to start in 1800, and we're going to kind of zoom all the way up to 2015. So the size of this graph over there is the number of people. So you'll see this thing kind of going bigger and bigger because you'll have more people in the world. And then you have the different regions and the different countries. Uh, you see the colors are here up to, to the upper right of the graph. So, so red, is, red is Asia. Uh, Kind of that uh, kind of bluish thing is Africa, green is, is, is Americas. And as time goes by, we're going to see this thing kind of uh, moving uh, to the right, of course. In 1800, you had basically 86% of the population living in extreme poverty. So now let's, let's, now let's run it, okay? And let's see how this moves from 1800 to uh, 2015. Of course, that this big red is China, no? Here you see the, the different continents. So 
So that's how, how, that's how the in, world, income in the world has been moving over time. So you remember, in basically you had in 1800 about 90% of the population living in extreme poverty. Can we see how that thing looked in 19, there you go, 85.9%. Can we see how it looks in 1990, if you're so kind? There you go. So by 1990, we had brought that down from 90 to 45. So pretty good, 190 years. Okay, let's see what happened in the next 10 years. So that is between 1990 and 19. Okay, so there you had brought it down from 45 to 30 in 10 years. And now we go to 15, to 2015. Now you're at 11%. So now in 15 years, you've brought it down from what? From 30 to 11. So this is kind of moving faster and faster and faster in terms of the improvement in, uh, improvement in, uh, in, in income. So that, that's, that's basically one way of showing to you not only that the world is growing, but it's growing faster and faster. And, and we're talking here of the moment of the world where the world has already been growing after 1800, is 18 centuries of no growth. Can we go back to the presentation? Thank you, thank you so much for the help with that. So let me show you two other things to kind of make the point that the uh, world growth is accelerating. And the first the one I want to show is this graph. This graph comes from a paper by uh, Bill Nordhaus. Uh, he was recently awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, a couple of months ago or something like that, okay? So he wrote this, it's, it's a very fun paper that he wrote uh, many years ago about the price of light. Because I want to see what the price of products are, the real price of products, how they're moving over time. And sometimes it's difficult to realize how much a product is becoming cheaper or cheaper because its quality is changing. For example, if you look at the price of a car today and compare it with the price of a car uh, 20 years ago, probably the car today is cheaper than 20 years ago. But if you adjust by quality, it's uh, much, much more cheaper. So the light, price of light for Nordhaus was a very good product because you can actually measure the exact same quality, which is a lumen. What's the price of producing a lumen, which is a kind of a hom homogeneous unit of light? So in his paper, I'm not showing it here, but in his paper, he starts with the caves. You know, in the ca when you lived in the caves, in order to get light, you had to go and kill the buffalo. So you had to spend a week chasing the buffalo, getting the fat from the buffalo, going back to the cave. Well, you got some meat also, a little bit, so you could eat the meat also. But uh, you get the fat, and then you do the torch, and then you have your lumens, OK? Well, it's very expensive. You have to work for a week to get the torch, OK? And then over time, uh, you have different uh, technologies to, to produce uh, light. And I don't know if this has a pointer or not, but this is in log scale. So the way you have to interpret this is when you go from 6 to 5, it means that the real price of a lumen has fallen to half. So, and this is just from 1800 until now, so you see. So the question is here, is this flattening out or is this kind of, kind of accelerating? And uh, maybe kind of, yeah, someone said kind of a straight line, so it's kind of reducing. It, it, there's no sense in which this thing is slowing down. And in fact, we may be a few years from you know, having solar light, powering light in your house, in which case the price of light will be just the fixed cost of putting the solar, solar panel, but then the cost per lumen will be actually really, 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 really small. So, so this thing is actually going to accelerate. I was, uh, yesterday night I was telling some people that in, uh, on Monday I was visiting an inventor at MIT, and uh, so, so this guy basically invented um, a needless injection. So basically instead of kind of putting a needle in your bottle to deliver medicine, he basically throws the medicine at the speed of light and kind of gets the medicine. You actually don't feel it, and then you get, this is patented, this is being used, this is being used already. And uh, I was seeing him because he wants to use this for agriculture. He wants to use the same technology to create what's called a tractorless farming. You don't need to kind of drag the land, you just kind of put the seed into the ground, and uh, you need less machinery. But the most interesting thing is that you have such a precision in where you put the seed that then you can actually put the seed with a drop of fertilizer because then you, you know where you have to put the fertilizer because you want to put it close to the seed. When you throw fertilizer, you kind of you throw it all around. And by putting, being able to put the fertilizer close to the seed and close to the roots of the plant, 
the use of fertilizer is just 1% of what would you use with traditional technologies. So, so it's kind of a lot of things kind of are happening which uh, basically show that uh, this uh, technological progress is, uh, is not abating. And, le and let me finish this part of the presentation with this thing that probably most of you know or have seen. That this is a Chinese game called Go. And a couple of years ago, uh, the artificial intelligence company of Google, which is called DeepMind, they set up to uh, program a, a machine to play this game. This is a game that you cannot uh, program it by looking at the different combinations as you, could, you can do with chess, because you see here that the blackboard is much bigger. So the number of combinations of moves here is bigger than the number of atoms in the universe. So that means that you, you can't have a machine kind of just computing. You just have to teach the machine to think. So they worked on this for, for two years. And uh, then when they finished, they told the machine, well, now play against yourself. Train yourself. And the machine played against itself one million times in five minutes. So that was kind of the training, the weightlifting. And uh, so once they did that, they said, OK, now we're going to play the world champion. OK? If this, interest, if this story interests you, there's actually a Netflix documentary on this, which is called AlphaGo, that you may want to look at. And uh, well, the machine was kind of unbeatable. And when the world champion finishes the match, he says, but this is a match that was going to be played in 1,000 years. This is not a match of 2015. This is a match of 3,015. Because Go, which has been played for 4,000 years, has had over, its, over every 1,000 years, has had kind of big changes in the structure in which people played it. So, this kind, so basically what this person was saying is, the machine has allowed me to accelerate the acquisition of knowledge. What it would have taken humans a thousand years, it took the machine five minutes. Okay? So, so once artificial intelligence starts, starting, starts teaching us and starts moving the frontier, well, remember I told you that if you would have asked someone in 1800 how the world was going to look like in 2000, and he wouldn't have guessed ever that there was going to be something called a cell phone or an iPad or a TV. Well, I think that if, you are, if we ask ourselves, how do, do we imagine the year 2000, to, uh, 2200, it's much, much off in terms of our imagination than these things were for someone in 1800. So I, I truly believe that. And I, and I finish with one, one final comment, which is the following. The technological progress that is happening now has a very peculiar feature, which is that it goes against the skilled workers. Because when you had the Industrial Revolution, you replaced the muscle, correct? So the unskilled worker suddenly had a competitor who was, was kind of a, a machine. This uh, technology goes against the skilled, which is very interesting because it's not only going to deliver more growth, but it's going to deliver a world where income is going to be more evenly distributed. I'll give you an example. Probably in 10 or 15 years, a doctor will be replaced by a machine, a traumatologist. You need to uh, diagnose it. What needs to be done with your body? Whatever the machine is going to do that, it's going to do it much better than the doctor. But replacing the nurses may take a couple of years more. So the relative wage between doctors and nurses is going to converge dramatically, if not kind of move the other way around. So, so kind of it's, it's, it's interesting in that regard. So, so I think that the challenge for I was when Alejandro was presenting the numbers, it was a little bit of a dismay of how low the income expected for Latin America is. No, you see, you see China, you see India, you see the developing world, you see the developed world growing somewhat faster than Latin America, and I think it has to do a lot to do with this of how prepared we are in Latin America to deal with these changes. And uh, there's a culture in Latin America of regulation. There's a culture of intervention. And those things are very negative for a society being able and being ready to absorb uh, these kind of technologies. I, I can give you, typically when that happens, it's because there's some kind of interest behind. I'll give you a couple of examples from my experience as governor of the Central Bank of Argentina. For example, when I got there, one of the, I had been CEO of a 
commercial bank for six years, so I very much had an idea of where the problems were or the, or the regulation which was useless. So for example, one regulation is that you had a very cumbersome process to open a branch. And I say, why? Why do you have a process to open a branch? Opening a branch means more financial inclusion, it means more hiring, more access points for fine. I, I, can't, I can't see anything bad. I mean, someone may do a bad business opening a branch, that's their problem, not my, as mine as a regulator. So I asked the regulators at the central bank, why is this regulation in place? And to be honest, the only interest that for that regulation to be in place was that of the regulators. So they had something to do. Okay, so we scrapped, we scrapped completely, we scrapped completely that regulation. So in Argentina today, if you want to open a branch, be my guest. As I told the bankers, I'll just stand up and clap, okay? And uh, no more regulation. Let, let me give you another one, which is kind of, uh, you have to get into the micro, but I'm giving it as examples, because I think this happens all over the economy. For example, banks had a regulation where you had to have a bunker. So you had to have inside the bank a guy in a kind of in a closed box because this is the guy who's going to call the police if something happens, okay? Well, it so happened that that's the most dangerous guy in the branch because he's alone with the cameras and he's alone. So he's the guy who rings up the phone and tells the guys outside, look, it's the one with the red coat which is leaving with a five million, okay? <laughs> Nobody controls him, so who controls the controller? So, and very expensive because you need to have the place, you have to have communication. So basically I allowed for what's called remote controlling. So you can actually have a bank, you can have kind of 50 branches on a, a, the, the, the images of 50 branches, you have three or four guys. It's much more difficult for the guy to lift up the phone and say they're living with a million if you have two guys besides you which are listening to you. So it's, it's much safer, but instead of having 50 guys controlling 50 branches, maybe you have three. Right? And, and my last example has to do with money transport. So in Argentina, money transportation was regulated by the military from the time we had a military government. So they constructed a whole technology in order to uh, be employed. So for example, if you money, you have to have like a blindado, how do you say, a, how do you say blindado? Armor car, and then it has to have police. And if you move city if, if money from one city to the next, you have to do it in the air force, airplanes, and things like that. And the, first of all, there's no reason for me to regulate money transportation because if a bank gets, gets some of its trucks stolen, I don't have a regulatory problem. I don't have a financial crisis. I have nothing. It's just someone who did a job and lost some money. And. Um, and, uh, and technology has changed. For example, today you have something which is the dying. You basically put the thing into the ATM and it has a little bag. And if you basically take the bag out, the, sorry, the, the, the thing the, from the ATM out, the, bo the bag explodes and then the bills are useless because they are kind of died, okay? So you can actually get someone with a backpack with the money and then the, the bag has a GPS and if the money deviates from the route from the GPS, then the, this thing explodes and the, and the money is basically unstoleable, okay? So you had new technology, so basically we scrapped completely the regulation. We said no regulation as to you, how you want to transport money. That's your issue, use the best technology, use the best cost, the lower, the lower cost. And, um, and each time you do these things, you have these interest groups kind of, they creep up and they try to stop you and they try to say that it's dangerous and that there are awful things are going to happen. And I think we need a lot, a lot of exercise in Latin America, in, in, competition, po in, in competition policies, in open. I think that's kind of the big thing which is going to allow Latin America to profit from this wave of innovation. And I think if you, th you think of Brazil and many other, Mexico, this is kind of all over the place. And I think this is kind of the biggest challenge that Latin America has, okay? So, okay, so that's, that's the first part of my presentation. Let me talk a little bit now about what I was us to talk about, okay? But I didn't want to mention these other things and I could keep on giving you examples of, of how we deregulated things and, and the crazy things that you find in the regulation and you say, my God, okay? And the, 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 the most worrisome thing is that you're one in, year into office and then you still discover things, okay? And so it's kind of years and years of this kind of uh, uh, methodology. Okay, so they asked me to talk a little bit about what we had learned, le uh, learned from debt restructurings and debt uh, problems 
in Latin America and from the uh, exchange rate crisis. And uh, so I'm just going to have one slide on the debt issue. This is taken from a book that I wrote a couple of years ago on debt restructurings. Uh, this is a book from around 2006. After that, we only had two default episodes, which were Argentina slipped back into default, and then, of course, you had Greece. No, we were kind of the two, two events that happened after that. And uh, I want to uh, say three things on this uh, table. I don't have a laser, a laser pointer. I don't have, no? Is it here? I don't know which I should, what thing I should press. Okay. The first thing is, uh, these are all the countries that defaulted between 98 and 2005, which was kind of a, a recent wave of defaults. The one that came after the debt crisis of the 1980s. The first thing is, look how strong Latin America is, uh, shows in this uh, table. I mean, you, okay, you have Russia and Ukraine and Pakistan, and Pakistan, Basically, they forced them to default at the Paris Club to kind of give them relief, uh, which was comparable to what they were giving. So basically, you have Russia and Ukraine, and then it's all Latin American countries. And we wrote a series, so that's, that's one, one thing which I think is, is kind, of, um, kind of worth pointing out. The other thing is, uh, in, the first, uh, in the first column, we just have their average haircut. Well, sorry. It also means that few countries default. So when you look at sovereign debt as a class, it's actually pretty safe. I mean, it's very few countries that have defaulted. So that's one comment. Of those, Latin America has an important part. Now, the column that says average haircut is basically how much money they took away with these debt restructurings. And the way this is computed is that you had a, you had a bond, you had a debt, you, know, you, you owned a bond from a country, which had some promise to pay. And then after they restructure, they say, well, that thought, what you thought we're going to pay, we're going to pay now. This is something different, this. And the haircut computes the loss, it compares those two uh, cash uh, flow streams, uh, discounted at the same discount rate, which is the one immediately after, prevailing immediately after the restructuring. And the point that I want to make from this table is that if you look, some of the numbers are not really that large. For example, if you look at the Uruguay had a, a haircut of 12%, 15%, uh, Ecuador had 28%, uh, Dominican Republic 1.5, basically nothing. Uh, so you have a lot of numbers there in the, in, in the 30s, 20, 30%, Well, Argentina was a bit more aggressive, 75%. But it's not like that you go into a restructuring and then you basically don't pay anything. You actually pay most of it. Most of the money you pay back one way or the other. So you kind of go through all the hassle of the default and at the end you end up saving what? 15%, 20%, 30%? You have to think if that's worth it. Well, that's the reason only some countries, very few countries do it. But the other thing which makes it even uh, more interesting is in the, in, the, in the column in the middle, I have a concept which is called debt relief, which is basically, you know, when the country restructures uh, and restructures at a time of distress, and maybe it's not kind of the, uh, maybe interest rates and the country risk of this country will come down when it, things are normalized. So what we did uh, is basically say, well, what would be the, 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 the equilibrium country risk of this country, taking into account the fundamentals of this country in terms of its uh, fiscal balance, its external balance, etc. And probably that number is much lower, or typically is substantially lower than the discount rate that public debt has immediately after the restructuring, which is a, a strong distress situation. So I'm going to illustrate it with one case. For example, in Uruguay, you see that it had a 15% haircut, but then it has minus 12 and minus 14 a debt relief. Why? Because you say, look, given the conditions of the Uruguayan economy, really country risk should be much lower. Probably it will converge to the much, that much lower discount rate. But what did Uruguay did? Uruguay basically extended payments for a long period of time at a relatively high interest rate, which was still lower than the rate prevailing before the restructuring. So that's why it had a haircut. But it was much higher than the equilibrium interest rate for Uruguay. So basically, you were promising to pay, say, 8% for 15 years. You had a debt which was due in two years. I said, no, I'm going to pay you 8% for 15 years, but the equilibrium discount rate is, was 6. 
So actually, you're committing yourself to paying a net present value more than you had before. So it ended up being a good deal. So, so basically, when you actually look at debt relief, uh, you see a lot of negatives there because it forces you to extend maturities at a relative high rate at a moment of distress. So the only thing, if you don't understand anything, don't worry. Um, the only thing I'm trying to say is, look, this debt restructuring things, usually they're not such a great deal in terms of reduction of the cost of what the country has to pay, okay? And I think that is a lesson that has been learned. It's much, much better deal to be current on your payments, to be reasonable, and forget about this, because if you actually get into this, on top, you don't save too much. So that, that would be kind of the main point I think you can get from this exercise. It took us about two years because we computed this haircut bond by bond. So we had to look at the uh, terms of each bond. So it was a, 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 a very uh, tiresome research project just to say this here, just to come here and say this, okay? So, uh, so I hope you're grateful for that, okay? Um, for all that work. Okay, so the other thing that, the other thing that, um, the other thing that is, um, uh, we've learned is that we need uh, countries in Latin America, which are small open economies, need to protect themselves from what happens in the rest of the world. They are economies that are integrated in the, to the rest of the world. So there are basically three ways to protect in yourself, which is a, it's the exchange rate regime, it's the buildup of reserves, and having sound fiscal policies. I'm not saying anything real new, but. Uh, but this is uh, also from my, from my research, which is uh, trying to identify, uh, about 15 years ago, we devised a, a, a new classification of exchange regimes. I'm not going to get into the details. Um, but basically what we see is that over time, more and more countries are using a floating exchange rate regime. And uh, having a floating exchange regime is an extraordinary way of cushioning the impact of uh, external uh, events on an economy. So, so more and more economies have used using floating exchange regime. I think it's it's pretty much a consensus nowadays that for a relatively large uh, middle income emerging economy, that's a much better exchange regime than having more more fixed exchange regimes. And I want to show you this. Don't don't get too scared. Um, it's basically one. I only want to show you one number, which is. In the first column, you see 0.057 in, in, the, in the red box. Okay, what this is, basically these uh, computations, what they're trying to assess is the impact on output of a sudden stop. A sudden stop is an event in which a country suddenly gets cut off from a foreign financing. So imagine a country that was using foreign debt and for some reason, it may be external, internal, or whatever, Basically, that, 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 uh, uh, that money is not coming in, so the country has to adjust, it has to accommodate the fact that now that money is not coming in. And it, you know, it's like a family. If you're in a family, you're living on debt, and then suddenly the bank says, no more debt, you have to pay back, what do you have to do? You do have to do an adjustment to accommodate the fact that you don't have those resources anymore. So what, we're, what we did in this paper is that we looked at the output effect of a sudden stop so we looked at all the countries in the world which had a sudden stop, which had this sudden curtailment in the availability of external finance. And then we said, if you have a floating exchange rate, do you do better in terms of output or you do uh, worse? And that 0.057 is the output effect of having a floating exchange regime. So the, the comparison group is having a more pegged exchange rate. So what I'm saying here is also simple, which is if you're facing a sudden withdrawal of capital flows from the rest of the world, you're, much, you're going to hold much better in terms of output if you have a floating exchange rate regime that you have a fixed exchange rate regime. And this is what empirically appears. And this is one of the reasons why I think countries, I mean, the fact that this uh, phenomenon exists is one of the reasons that countries uh, have preferred to use uh, fix, uh, floating exchange rates in recent times, okay? Well, of course, the other thing that you do is um, you, you accumulate reserves. Here I'm showing you Mexico, Peru, South, South Africa, and Brazil. Uh, very significant buildups of reserves over the last uh, 15, 20 years, and that also is kind of an insurance uh, mechanism. This is, uh, this is the case of Argentina. Actually, this is during my tenure as, as governor of the Central Bank. We basically brought up international reserves from 
something close to below 5% to about 11, 12% of GDP. So a 5% buildup of, of gross reserves. So we actually also try to provide some, some insurance uh, on that side. In, in our case, in the case of Argentina, the, um, something kind of a little bit uh, paradoxical happened, which is that why we, will, we were building these reserves. Of course, nobody kind of gives you 7% of GDP for free. So you have to buy those reserves. You have to, when you buy the reserves, you issue pesos. And then what we need to do at the same time is to bring those pesos in, back into the balance sheet of the central bank so that they don't create inflation. So we had to, do, we had to issue a debt to sterilize, to bring back in those pesos that we were buying from accumulating the debt. So, so there was a whole debate in Argentina. Is, is it good to accumulate uh, reserves or not? Uh, certainly having reserves are good because when you know, you have trouble, then the exchange rate depreciates and those reserves are worth much more. That's basically the hedging that reserves give you. But uh, because you were building these liabilities, people are saying, oh, but you know, you're building reserves, but you're having the liability. So, so that was something that was very contentious and that was a, was a debate and I think uh, reduced a little bit um, the, the insurance uh, power of, of reserves, at least in the case of, of Argentina. And then, uh, and then finally, I think we learned that in order to have a stable macroeconomic policies, you need to have, you have to be able to do counter cyclical fiscal policy and counter cyclical monetary policy also. Uh, Alejandro showed this uh, a while ago, which is that countries which have stable economies, they can have kind of a counter cyclical monetary policy. And uh, that's basically shown by re the reduction in the inflation rate. The fact that inflation rate in Latin America has fallen implies uh, effectively that countries have moved to a much more solid uh, fiscal framework, and, and, and it shows here. In, in this graph, I basically excluded Venezuela and excluded Argentina, okay, because it's kind of, because I want to show really that, that the bulk of the countries have really kind of uh, understood that this is, uh, this is something, and, and it, it's been dramatic, the, the, the improvement in Latin America in this sense. So, so Latin America has moved towards a more floating exchange rate, has moved, has built up reserves, so it has kind of a, an insurance to the sudden stops, and it has a, a lower inflation and a much sounder fiscal framework. So I think Latin America as a whole is, from a macroeconomic point of view, is much better than 15 years ago. So to be honest, w with the exception of Venezuela and Argentina, which are kind of perhaps still struggling to get this uh, in order, the problem in Latin America is the first one. It's the productivity. It's the competition policies. This, has, uh, this uh, looks uh, in much better shape than, uh, you know, this is the business school, no? So at the end of the day, the only thing I'm saying is keep your contracts and have your accounts in order, you know? So the guys here from the business school say, I mean, these economists, they work so much, and then they basically say the obvious. But, uh, but this is, this is, this is uh, where we are in Latin America. I think we've done a huge improvement in, in this regard. So let me, let me finish um, talking a little bit about uh, Argentina. And particularly what I'm going to do is uh, tell you a little bit what has been happening over the, the recent, uh, the recent uh, two years uh, with keeping in mind how Argentina has absorbed these lessons that I was just uh, mentioning, okay? So uh, when, when the President Macri started his tenure, he, of course, we inherited a very, signif very significant challenges. For example, we had a black market exchange rate, which was trading at a 50% premium over the official rate. We had no reserves in the central bank. We had, a, which of course we couldn't say, okay, at the time, because uh, uh, we had a very large uh, budget deficit. We had a um, government expenditure, which had grown 12 points of GDP over the previous uh, seven, eight years. So, so huge uh, challenges in terms of macroeconomic policy. And we decided to go to a framework of inflation targeting uh, with a floating exchange rate. So to some extent, trying to provide a, a macroeconomic framework and also keep in mind that we need the floating exchange rate to, 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 to protect us, uh, ourselves from, and this is basically what happened. This, this is basically how, um, how um, inflation evolved, this is core inflation. Uh, so that is taking out uh, the regulated price. So I would say that uh, in, in the first two years it was pretty successful. You see a blip there at, at the beginning and that has to do with the fact that of course we had a huge, uh, we unified the exchange rate 
basically three days after I, I took office at the central bank, we unified the exchange rate, that went pretty smoothly. But at the same time, the government had to adjust uh, utility prices uh, very significantly. And in the previous government, the uh, inflation rate over the previous year had been 1,000%. So prices had multiplied by 10, but utility prices have remained frozen. So basically you had to move utility prices 10 times, okay? So the government started the process of adjusting utility prices and that kind of, uh, of course, affects expectations and affects uh, the inflation dynamics. So that's kind of the, the initial jump that you had in inflation, which was, there it shows on the year on year, but it was mostly at the beginning of 2016. And then you see that you had a very steady decline in, in core inflation through uh, December of 2017. And what's, what's interesting is that that decline in inflation came with a very substantial recovery of, of the Argentinian economy. So, so the economy had, a, had a, we were coming from a recession. In, in the second quarter of 2016, we had some, you see there that mi minus one nine, because you, you may ask yourself, the government in the first three months did two things, unify the exchange rate market and resolve the default of its debt. So you say two things that really are very good and normalize and make, a, so why did the economy fall 1.9%? And these are the kind of things that when, after they happened, you say, oh, how stupid, it was so obvious that this was going to happen. What had happened? What had happened is that in the previous year, as people were expecting the unification of the exchange rate and a sharp depreciation, you had had a very significant accumulation of inventories. So, you know, everybody was buying all, all the inputs that they needed for 10 years onwards because they knew that they were never going to get an exchange rate so cheap if they could get it from the central bank. So you needed to import 100, you asked for 1,000, and maybe you imported 300. And uh, so construction, people depleted their savings prior to the devaluation. So after that, you had a smooth transition after the removal of the exchange rate controls then people say, well, I, now I don't need to, I, now I have to bring down my inventories. And that, in fact, during um, the second quarter, the fall in inventories was bigger than the drop of GDP in the whole of the year. So, so we had like an inventory cycle, but very shortly after, you see in the third quarter of 2016, the economy st uh, started growing again and then started growing very steadily at around 1% per quarter. And that growth was the, the most stable growth in terms of quarter to quarter variation in the last 30 years in Argentina, which we attributed to the floating exchange rate, which was kind of a smoothing, smoothing the path. So, so this, is, um, this is how uh, we got to the end of uh, 2017. Now, it, the, 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 here the, the, um, the, the lighter blue is not core inflation, but it's headline inflation. So that includes the effect of regulated prices. So in fact, in the second half of 2017, uh, overall inflation kind of stagnated there between 21 and, and 24%. In December, the, after winning the elections, the government kind of uh, uh, revamped and accelerated the adjustment of relative prices. So there was a big blip of, of inflation in December. And um, so I think that created somehow the sense that the, this inflation process was somehow slowing down or, or was in trouble. And then the government decides here, and Alejandro uh, mentioned that at, uh, when he was talking about Argentina earlier, that the government decided to change the inflation targets for 2018. So the inflation, inflation targets were 10%, uh, inflation expectations were about 15%. So a government decided to move uh, the inflation uh, target to 15, to kind of match it, which was expectations. This was a big discussion between the central bank and the executive. We thought that raised the possibility of de-anchoring expectations because once you as a government tell the population that you are willing to take more inflation, people ask how much more inflation? And, and, and then the whole process is a little bit uh, de-anchored. And uh, well, this is what was happening with the exchange rate, which was had depreciated and then remained relatively, relatively stable, of course, with some, some fluctuations. Uh, I'll, I'll get back to this in a second. But look at what happened with the inflation process uh, after the, uh, the, the change of the inflation target. So, so in fact, what we, we feared, which was the, the anchoring of, of expectations, unfortunately happened. 
and then accelerated uh, throughout uh, the year and had its peak basically in September of, of this year, okay? I think October is, is going to remain. This, this, this is so you get an idea. These are our inflation expectations until December 17. Uh, they had grown up, uh, they had increased by 1.9% in the 15 months prior. So um, at the time that was also a source of concern that inflation expectations were not coming down, they were going up, uh, even though people expected lower inflation for, for 2019 and 19. But then after the change in the inflation targets, in the immediate month after the change, uh, inflation expectations increased more than in the previous 15 months. And then as, as the year went uh, forward and, uh, and, and, and this, uh, I mean, the institutional framework was, was perceived as being weaker, uh, then basically inflation expectations uh, kind of uh, went, uh, went off the roof, no? So this is, this is um, Okay, so, so the, basically what happened is that monetary policy had to react with increasing tightness. With increasing tightness. The floating exchange rate, and this basically is, is the way I'm kind of getting to linking this Argentinian experience with, uh, with uh, the lessons. So what happened is throughout 2018 that the government realized that it had uh, processed the anchor. So it, it started implementing a much tighter monetary policy. Uh, so we started here that we brought the interest rate to 40% and then it continued to go up there. So a very tight monetary policy. I think that was, so I think that was a very important lesson that was learned uh, that you uh, can't play with expectations and uh, with monetary policy, you have to be very decisive and very, very, very strong. So I think this is, this is a, a first important lesson. Of course, the government uh, did a fiscal program that was shown in, in the first presentation to improve the fiscal balances. So I think that is reserves were somewhat protected. And, um, and uh, the program with the IMF allowed to avoid any possibility of uh, debt default in, in the next two years. And the floating exchange rate was never challenged uh, from a conceptual point of view. So you, you see the lessons that we learn is avoid defaults, perfect, so you do the program with the IMF. Keep the floating exchange rate, which is that helps to smooth output. Okay, the exchange, floating exchange rate was never challenged. Um, and they have a good institutional framework, uh, both in terms of macro, in terms of fiscal and monetary. I think that this shock that happened uh, at the beginning of this year was a kind of uh, uh, a big shock for the government, for society, but which I think was processed in the right way. I mean, the lessons which were learned were the right lessons to be learned, which is, okay, now we have to have a sounder fiscal policy and we have to have a tougher monetary policy. So, so I think in that sense, the, the prospect going forward for Argentina is, uh, I'm very optimistic because I think, uh, again, uh, we haven't scrapped the good things and we've improved the things that needed still to be improved. Let me just, uh, this is basically what happened to output throughout the year. So it's been, I say this has been a shock because certainly that the anchoring of expectations created a, a reduction. The reduction in the second quarter in Argentina has a lot to do with the drought. Argentina had the, the biggest drought in 60 years. Uh, agricultural production, which is very big in Argentina, fall 30% in the second quarter. So I think that, that 4.1, it's a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say exaggerated because it's a real number, but has a, a, a relevant and important part of it is the, the agricultural. This is how the nominal exchange rate evolved over the year, and this is the real exchange rate. So, so you've, you've allowed the exchange rate to play its role of, of allowing the economy to do the adjustment that it, it need, needs to be done. So, so I think that is, uh, this is important, and this is just so that you get, you get an, a feel as to where the real exchange rate is from a historical comparison. Here we have the 1990s. Some of you, the, 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 uh, the older among you, which maybe worked in, in this field in the 1990s, remember that Argentina had a fixed exchange rate at the time. And uh, this is, uh, there is where you had the, the real exchange rate. Then you had uh, the, the fall of that exchange rate at the beginning of, of 2002. You had a big depreciation, then the economy kind of depreci appreciated its currency over the next 15 years. And now really the economy has gone to a real exchange rate that we've seen very few times because the, it's at a level of mo almost the crisis leaving convertibility. So, 
So if I would have to get, uh, make a guess from this, is that the exchange rate has more, more room to appreciate than to depreciate. But of course, it's, uh, that's, that's to be seen. It's, uh, it's always tricky to, to anticipate these movements. But, but from a historical comparison, imagine that Argentina in, in the nine, beginning of 1990s produces 60, 70 million tons of crops, and today produces 120. So things happen on the product, productivity side of the economy as well. But, uh, but this is basically what has happened uh, so far through the year. And the, the only important thing for me is that you allow the f a floating exchange rate to do its job. I think that's kind of the key, the key lesson that has been. So, so I think Argentina has processed very well the lessons it had to learn from the mistakes at the end of last year when, when it undermined the, the inflation target in regime. So, so let me finish with uh, summing up. What, what we've talked on, on, on the three things. Uh, uh, the, the first thing I said is that I think the world is, is, is growing, and is growing faster and faster. I hope I minimally convince you that that at least is a possibility. I think it's, it's a very real fact, and I think it's, uh, it's just going to uh, go, go faster as we go along. Um, it has this crucial feature which is that this growth is different from previous growth experiences. It's going to produce more income and a more equal uh, distribution of income, which I think is, is something that is it's, it's also interesting to think about because whenever we talk about growth and technology, we talk about jobs and we're worried about what's going to happen and we think that people are going to, we're going to kind of um, uh, separate incomes among people. And I think there's sound reasons to think that it actually may be exactly the opposite. So it's something to think about. I think for Latin America, this is where Latin America is weaker in terms of having the institutional framework to absorb all this change. Latin America needs much more competition policies, needs to open up much more to innovation um, in, a, in a very dramatic way. It doesn't have the culture to do that. It's a society which for many years have kind of lived out of regulation. When you do regulation, you create the interest group and then the interest group fights for the regulation not to be uh, released. So you need a lot of, uh, well, the dean said, no, you want leaders which are, um, what was, how did he characterize it? Like, you know, principled. I think he said principled leaders, no? You need principled political leaders that are willing to fight for the common good and not defend the, the interest. So I think uh, that's, that's going to be key. You have to, you, you need to have the macro out of your mind in order to do that. For this, you need a, ma a macro which is able to absorb shocks. And uh, so you need, you need a good exchange for regime, you need good fiscal policies, and you need to be careful with your debt. And I think that those, are les those lessons, I think, uh, have been learned, and I think that uh, they're pretty much uh, ingrained in, 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 in Latin America. And of course, through the leadership of, through many years of Agustin and other people like him, which basically uh, established this framework for Latin America and did, did a lot of, of, of good in doing that, okay? Um, in the case of Argentina, perhaps uh, I already, already said that I think all these lessons of what needs to be for the macro, I think, have, have been well learned. And, and that's uh, very encouraging this uh, year. I think it, um, it needs to strengthen even further its, uh, its macro framework. Um, I remember that at the beginning of the tenure, the president said, let's, Federico, and I, I talked about this with Agustin at the time, and he said it was a big mistake what I had done. And of course he was right, no, um, as usual. But uh, the president had asked me, said, let's send, let's send a law to institute the independence of the central bank, because central bank is not fully independent. It's, it's independent in terms of how to implement policies, but the president can remove the authorities. And, and I remember I, t I telling the president at the time is, look, we, Argentina is full of laws. I mean, we've changed the laws all the time, and we think that by changing the law, we're going to change ourselves. No, we change ourselves if we change ourselves, not if we change the law. So let's change ourselves, and let's do a sensible uh, monetary policy. Let's bring inflation down, and, um, and, then, and then the law is going to change on its own, which is a little bit, for example, the process that the UK had. It, when, when Thatcher brought down inflation, it did it under a framework where the Bank of England was not fully independent, but she showed the benefit to the economy to reduce in inflation, and then it was Tony Blair which gave the independence to the, to the, to the central bank, and it was not actually uh, the, the, the conservative government. So I was basically hoping for something like that. Agustin said, no, look, if they offered it to you, go for it, okay? 
And, uh, and I think that is, uh, that is a lesson which, uh, which also, uh, personally, I have learned, and uh, I think uh, Argentina needs to do that uh, to strengthen to strengthen its, its institutional framework. I think it's coming. We've, we've put it in that program with the IMF, so probably it will happen uh, next year, and I think that will, will put Argentina definitely on the road to, to stability that it so desperately needs. Okay? Thank you. very much, Federico. I think uh, I, I like the fact that you uh, went into a different mandate because I think your first part of the, the presentation was very interesting. It reminds me when I, I just came back from Brazil to Miami around June and I started to work at uh, an office at WeWork. Uh -huh. And uh, all kids, uh, all uh, basically information technology and so on. It was almost like I had traveled in a time machine from the past <laughs> <laughs> into the future that I was not very familiar with. So yeah. I, I really see your point. But I'd like to take this opportunity to open uh, the floor for questions. Daniel? And the question is, why? why? <laughs> okay. Uh, no, it, it was not really th uh, because of the elections. Remember, the elections had already passed. The elections were in October. The government won, won the elections. And this is, I think, I think it was because th the environment was so benign. I mean, you had expectations of inflation coming down in the next year, that it co growth was going to continue. For example, in December of 2000, in December of 2017, a credit growth was growing at 25% real. Um, so, so it is a little bit of a puzzle as to why. And, and, and there, were, there were different actors and there were different interests. I think uh, to some extent the government started, w you know when, let me show you this. Immediately after the election, uh, inflation was coming down uh, core inflation was coming down. Overall inflation was kind of stagnant. So we actually tightened monetary policy. I don't know if you see it before the dotted line, those hikes in the interest rate. So it was kind of our push to say, okay, now we kind of bring it definitely down in, in 2018. And there was concerns by some people that we were kind of taking the economy to an equilibrium with a very appreciated exchange rate and that, that could affect growth. And it was a debate. It was a debate. And eventually, the, the inflation targets in Argentina are set by the executive. So we tried to argue not to change that, but the decision was taken. Now, once the decision was taken and the process unfolded, once the exchange rate started to move, I was very relaxed in uh, selling the reserves. Why? Because remember, I had bought the reserves, but I had the liabilities. And my point was, look, I'm going, I'm buying this because it's an insurance mechanism when you have a, you have a jump in the exchange rate, you have a crisis, etc. Well, and that was happening in April. So the natural thing to do was to let the exchange rate move somewhat, and uh, or, or or as much as you felt comfortable. But at some point, you said, well, maybe I want these people that came in to buy these uh, liabilities. Now they want to get, they want, and I. I bought the reserves to avoid an excessive exchange rate appreciation. Now when they want out, I sell, uh, I sell uh, the reserves and I smooth the movement of the exchange rate on the way in and I smooth it on the way out. No, not avoiding the, the structural changes that need to be made, but certainly there were foreigners that have come into domestic paper and they came in, you smooth, you, you, they come out. So, so I was pr pretty relaxed. And in fact, uh, between April, May, and June, I, we sold about we sold about fifteen billion dollars of reserves, but we brought down the liabilities of the central bank by a third. And but, but it w this was something a little bit uh, difficult to manage because, for example, when we were accumulating the reserves, people complained about the liabilities. Say, oh, you're piling up liabilities. I said, no, I'm piling up. Yeah, but I'm piling up reserves as well. Okay. 
when I started selling the reserves, people complained about selling the reserves. Not that I was bringing down the liabilities. No? So, so that was a little bit difficult to manage in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the communication and in terms of the strength that you had in, in your balance sheet. No? The balance sheet of the central bank actually improved dramatically this year. No? So, uh, so, so people were thinking that the liabilities were a problem, but then actually it turned out that when you had the adjustment made, it worked exactly in the way that you expected, which is to make your balance sheet stronger and allow you to to, to adjust. And, and let me say something else. Looking in, in hindsight, it's, I'm so glad that I bought those reserves. Because imagine if we would have had the sudden stop without the reserves. So to some extent, we smooth a little bit those, those movements in the capital flows. And, uh, and I think that kind of uh, bore us time before we brought Alejandro on with the IMF program and, uh, and, and somehow s smooth a little bit the, the shock. I also think that the shock perhaps was bigger than it would have been if you would not have had the shock of December, the, cha the institutional change in December. Right? But that's, that's just a hypothesis. Yeah, no, I mean, we know, we know this, you know, it's, you have to have a tight monetary policy. At the end of the day, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. Now, is, uh, something that is interesting is that we set an inflation targeting regime, which basically works by fixing the interest rate. And, uh, and so, so if inflation is higher than you want it to be, you jack up interest rate, which is that you tighten monetary conditions. And if it's lower, you can ease monetary conditions. That's, that's the way it works uh, all over the place. When, when, remember, I remember in 2015 when, the, when, the pres, when we were doing the program, the president, the only constraint that he gave us was that the fiscal program was going to be gradual. I mean, you started with a large deficit, so you had, you're going to, we're going to reduce gradually the, the I think I'll explain in a minute why the, I think that made some sense from a political point of view. Uh, so that implied that over the, previous, the first years of the program, we knew the central bank was still going to have to finance somewhat the treasury. So the inflation targets that were chosen were consistent with the amount of money that we had planned the central bank was going to transfer to the treasury to finance that, the fact that the adjustment in, in the fiscal numbers were going to be gradual, okay? So um, um, obviously as a central bank, you always would have preferred for those transfers to be lower, because then it's much easier to achieve the, this, the disinflation. And I think at some point uh, we decided to go all the way. And in fact, when uh, we did the program with Alejandro, we imposed the restriction that the central bank is not going to transfer uh, any more money to the, to the treasury. I think that's uh, from a signal point of view and from a fundamental point of view is a very important step towards reducing inflation. And now in, in the second version of the program, they basically went to a, a system of just saying, okay, we're going to grow the, the, the money base 10% uh, in the first year, because it's 10%, it's you have the seasonals that don't come back. So it's 10% growth in the, in the money. And so, and so basically inflation somehow has to converge uh, quickly to that number. And one advantage of the, uh, I, I have to, to acknowledge this, one advantage of the, infl the monetary aggregates to the inflation target is that it makes it much clearer for everybody that, that the core of the inflation problem is the monetary policy. And I think that is a very important step because in Argentina we've been discussing inflation for 30 years and we, you can hear the most extravagant stories as to why inflation, you know? Things like, for example, it's the businessman and then you say, gee, but this, I mean, Carrefour sells in France. It's the same guys, okay? Or you say, oh, this same guy, in the 1990s, the inflation was zero, and it's the same guys. So, so now they became evil. Now they, so, so you get all kinds of crazy stories, and I think that it's, it's a great, great uh, move, uh, step forward in the fight against inflation that we truly, as a society, identify where the source of the inflation is, which is in monetary policy. And the inflation targeting, of course, had it in the background, but I think from a, from a, from a, it was more difficult to sell, even though um, it may have other advantages uh, relative to monetary aggregate. So, 
So I think in that, uh, now of course, to have that monetary policy, you have to have the fiscal under control. So the government has made a big effort to go from a deficit of 7% of GDP to a primary balance next year. So, so at the same time, it has been working on the fiscal accounts to create the environment so that that monetary policy has, uh, has the credibility it, it, it deserves to be. Uh, let me finish with one uh, comment, uh, which, which is subtle. It's very specific to Argentina, but I want to mention it, which is that uh, in Argentina, there has been a lot of criticism to the fact that the government established this gradual um, fiscal uh, program. Like that, people say, no, you should have reduced the deficit much faster, which of course always is good to reduce the deficit. You're going to get a sounder macroeconomy. I mean, and that's not, not debatable. That's certainly the case. But I think that one objective that the government had was um, in Argentina, you know, it's, you have a lot of people who they love, uh, I mean, you have like the populist guys, and then you have the center, center right, uh, parties and, and historically the center center right parties whenever they took office they started with a big adjustment and so people were kind of I mean what are these guys doing I mean wh wh they, they come and they do this big, big adjustment no and kind of politically it was like you were in a box there you know of um, and I think the President Macri has been able to kind of uh, detach himself from that stereotype. No? So his, I think today the population sees him as a very concerned uh, politician, uh, that really wants things to do, go as well as possible. So you know, it's like you choose friends not because of, why do you choose a friend? You choose a friend of how you feel, how you connect with him on, on that. And uh, I think Macri has been able to connect in, in a way that the Argentinians feel that things can go better or can be worse, but the intentions of the government are the best. And at the, at the moment of voting, I think that's as important as how things are going because I repeat, things can be, uh, you may have trouble, but if you're doing your best to solve the troubles and the troubles are not your own doing or your own willingness, uh, the impact on the political uh, is much it's much less, no? And uh, so that's why I have the expectation that the government will do very well in the elections uh, next year because I think the, pro the IMF program is going to stabilize the macroeconomy, the inflation is going to be coming down, and, uh, and in addition, the government has been able to make this connection with the Argentinian population and, and people understand that it's the government that is trying to work for the best for the country. Carlos?
Well, no, no, I, I was just saying that the, the, the quantitative kind of has this virtue of kind of focusing. Uh, I think inflation targeting through December worked very well, so December of last year, no? And inflation was coming down. It had fallen 15% in 2017 alone, and the uh, core inflation was already on the 17, 18. So I think it's not a problem. I mean, Argentina probably is the first country that abandoned inflation targeting, but it also abandoned inflation targeting that was working, so that makes it very, very peculiar. Yeah. But uh, no, in terms of the debt, on, on terms of the debt um, structure, uh, I didn't mention this, but the debt restructuring episodes have a very significant effect on output. And uh, this is other research that, that we've done. It's it's lasting effect. Sometimes debt restructuring is a, a mingle with the financial sector because in many of these economies, a lot of the debt is held by the banks. So when you kind of move into a bank restructuring, then it actually combines with a financial crisis, and then the effect is really devastating. So, so and, and in many of those episodes, those things get combined. So I think I think the takeaway from from the restructuring is that the story, what we've seen, with the benefit of looking at the history, if it's a, it's a government who says I'm going to a debt restructuring because I'm going to clean my balance sheet and I'm going to save a lot of my debt. It typically has not worked. And look, I'm talking from Argentina, which one of one of the ones which got the biggest haircut, no? But but when I look at the, the history of the the whole group of countries, I think it's not uh, it's not a great deal to to kind of uh, push this uh, push this forward, no? I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, dare um, say what the Brazilian government has to do. I I'm not an expert on the, on the Brazilian economy. Uh, certainly, just looking at uh, just by looking at Alejandro's slides, you realize there's a fiscal issue. But maybe I would like to stress is the competi competitive policies. And you cannot imagine the impact that has on the well-being of people and on the investment climate. I mean, for example, in the case in, in the sense of freedom. When we f freed the exchange rate market, which everybody thought was going to be a catastrophe, um, the improvement in the general conditions from you know just making that market work and let it work and let it find its equilibrium, it's a, it's a, it was of, was of a size which it was kind of a, we couldn't have imagined. So it's something that I think is. If you look at the Argentinian economy, I look at the Brazilian economy, I think the Mexican economy, the, the, the benefits of this, letting people work, letting people be free, letting people interact, uh, has an impact on, uh, on, on the economy, on the business climate that far exceeds the macro. And I think Latin America has to focus uh, squarely on that. On that thank note. And, uh, thank you very much, uh, Federico, for okay. your great presentation. Ah. The conference. Yes, the lunch uh, will be served outside. It's ready, and uh, we're going to regroup at 1:40 p.m. Thank you. Muy bien,